He wrote, because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it's at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we're willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And uh, in 1981, as the United States was launching a new crusade for freedom, uh, Samuel Huntington, the professor of government at Harvard, uh, said in a private but published discussion, uh, interchange, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine. The, uh, the basic uh, problem is this. Uh, the idea is that if you have a society in which the voice of the people is heard, you got to make sure that that voice says the right thing. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You, you got a club in your hand, uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. And in fact, I think you find much more sophisticated concern uh, for thought control precisely as the society becomes more free. According to this alternative view, the media do indeed fulfill a societal purpose, but a very different one. Their societal purpose is to inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. We're privileged to see and hear a presentation by one of America's foremost intellectuals, Noam Chomsky, as he evaluates the American power structure and the mass media, right now on Alternative Views. I've talked to some people who live in other countries who have traveled widely, and they say that Americans are the most heavily indoctrinated and propagandized people that they have ever encountered in their travels. Well, why should this be if this is the land of the free press and democracy? One of America's leading intellectuals, Noam Chomsky, discusses this in his book, which he co-authored, called Manufacturing Consent. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Chomsky to give us an address on this subject of why Americans are so manipulated and controlled and how far back in our history this goes. Dr. Chomsky is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology specializing in linguistics. The title, uh, particularly the subtitle, Manufacture of Consent in a democratic society is uh, a bit paradoxical. Uh, manufacture of consent refers to indoctrination, and indoctrination is inconsistent with a democratic society, so you can't have manufacture of consent in a democratic society. Uh, there's, in fact, a standard view on this matter which does make it inconsistent. The standard view is expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell when he speaks of what he calls the societal purpose of the First Amendment, uh, enabling the public to assert meaningful control over uh, the political process. And that's a pretty obvious idea. It, the idea is that a democracy functions to the extent that people have uh, free access to, um, uh, to information and opinion, and of course the opportunity to act on it. Uh, well, that sounds obvious, in fact, perhaps almost tautological, uh, 
Uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view, in fact, a very well-represented contrary view. In fact, the contrary view is probably the dominant view among uh, uh, people who actually have written and thought about uh, the nature of modern democracy. And this contrary view can be traced right back to the origins of modern democracy in the 17th century English Revolution, uh, as in the case of most revolutions, maybe virtually all, that was a multidimensional affair with a civil war between the supporters of the king and the supporters of parliament, but then a big popular movement was against all of them uh, and didn't want uh, and was trying to and had a very uh, populist, radical, democratic character to it and was defeated. The Democrats were defeated within about 20 years by 1660 and you read their pamphlets, they were saying that We've lost. The only question now is whose slaves the poor shall be, uh, king or parliament. Uh, many revolutions have the same consequence. Uh, maybe all so far, till one yet to come. Uh, uh, in the course of that struggle, there was a great deal of concern over the fact that the general population was gaining the opportunity uh, and the, even the idea of becoming involved directly in shaping their own affairs. Uh, and that led to great concerns. Uh, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen, uh, the spinsters and dairy maids, must be told what to believe. Uh, the greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Uh, one of the contemporary historians, a man named Clement Walker, uh, wrote at the time that of uh, the deep concern of the liberal elements we're talking about now over the fact that uh, these guys with their little printing presses putting out pamphlets and you know agitating in the army and that sort of thing uh, were beginning to reveal the mysteries of government uh, and he said if they do that uh, they will make people so curious and arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule that has to be stopped uh, and the same idea comes right up to the modern period. Without running through the American Revolution, you can find it and so on. In the modern period, uh, you find major thinkers picking up the same themes. For example, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a much respected moralist and political thinker and very, very influential and among modern political leaders, uh, wrote that rationality belongs to the cool observers. Uh, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And the naive faith of the proletarian requires necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications, which have to be provided by mythmakers to keep the ordinary person on the right course. Uh, Walter Lippmann, who was the dean of American journalists, uh, wrote about what he called the manufacture of consent. That's where that phrase comes from. And he said that the manufacture of consent has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government in a revolution in the practice of democracy. And this, he thought, was appropriate because the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality. That would be Niebuhr's cool observers. Now that was right after World War I, and the timing is important. During World War I, uh, John Dewey's circle of liberal intellectuals uh, were extremely impressed with, uh, in their words, in their perception, with having imposed their will upon a reluctant and indifferent majority uh, with the aid of propaganda fabrications about Hun atrocities and jingoistic uh, oversimplifications. The point was that, as usual, the population was pacifistic and didn't want to go to war. Didn't see any point in it. In fact, Woodrow Wilson won the 1916 election uh, on the slogan, uh, Peace Without Victory, uh, a mandate which he predictably interpreted as meaning victory without peace very quickly. Uh, and uh, with the aid of the intellectuals, they felt at least, maybe they were exaggerating their own contribution, that they had whipped the population into a war fever. Uh, and, uh, American uh, historians also joined enthusiastically in the cause. Uh, they formed the National Board for Historical Service. Uh, the founder of it, 
uh, said that what was needed was what he called historical engineering, uh, a method to serve the state by explaining the issues of the war so that we might better win it. Uh, the Wilson administration established the first official government propaganda agency uh, in the United States called the Creel Commission, Commission on Public Information, which was a straight propaganda agency to try to uh, turn this reluctant and indifferent majority uh, into a willingness to uh, fight the war and succumb to jingoistic uh, fanaticism. That's actually a predecessor of a much more ambitious program uh, developed during the Reagan administration uh, the Reagan's Office of Latin American Public Diplomacy, theoretically under the State Department, but actually apparently run by the National Security Council. Uh, that was an illegal operation, uh, as the Congressional General Accounting Office later uh, concluded in a study of it, a legal operation which had the intent of intimidating critics and uh, controlling a debate and discussion over Central America. Its goals, as they put it, were to demonize the Sandinistas uh, and, of course, to uh, build up support for the U.S. client states, the U.S. terror states in the region. Now, that was exposed during the Iran-Contra hearings by one of the very few journalists who actually uh, did some work on the hearings, did some journalistic work instead of just repeating the handouts. Uh, Alfonso Chardy of the Miami Herald exposed this, and when he exposed, began expo later came out a lot more details in congressional hearings. Uh, when he exposed it, he went to high administration officials to, who, to ask them to talk about it, and they described the, these propaganda efforts as a spectacular success. Uh, one of them described the efforts as the kind of operation that you would carry out in enemy territory. That's a very evocative phrase, and it expresses the attitude of the Reaganite uh, uh, political leaders and, in fact, of state leaders generally towards their own populations. They're an enemy. It's the domestic enemy that you have to control and marginalize. And you want to make sure that they don't become so curious and arrogant that they won't find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. Uh, the, uh, out of the uh, Creel Commission, but going back to World War I, there were a number of consequences. One of the members of the Creel Commission was a man who went on to become the leading figure and sort of patron saint of the modern public relations industry, uh, Edward Bernays. Uh, he later wrote about what he called the engineering of consent, which he said was the essence of democracy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and the public relations industry is devoted, in the words of its own, to major industry, that, which was devoted to controlling what they call the public mind uh, educating the American people about the economic facts of life to ensure a favorable climate for business and a proper understanding of the common interests. Uh, the public mind, uh, one AT&T executive observed 80 years ago, the public mind is the only serious danger facing the company, and it's got to be controlled. Uh, Edward Bernays went on uh, to carry out such operations as demonizing the democratic capitalist government of Guatemala working for the United Fruit Company when the United States was planning to overthrow it, as it did in 1954, turning the country into a charnel house, which has remained ever since. Uh, there's also an academic twist to all of this. In fact, it's a major theme in the academic social sciences. Uh, going back at least 50 years or more, one of the most prominent modern American political scientists, Harold Laswell, who's a leading figure in uh, communications and such things. Uh, he wrote the article on propaganda in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, which was published in 1933. Uh, and in it, he says that we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not. Uh, the best judges are the elites, us smart guys, the cool observers. And we must therefore be ensured the means to impose our will for the common good, of course. This, he said, will require a whole tech new technique of control, largely through propaganda, because of the ignorance and superstition of the masses. Same theme all the way through. Uh, the basic problem is this. Uh, the idea is that if you have a society in which the voice of the people is heard, you've got to make sure that that voice says the right thing. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You've you got a club in your hand, 
uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. And in fact, I think you find much more sophisticated concern uh, for thought control precisely as the society becomes more free. I don't think it's surprising that the sophisticated discussion, uh, things like the public relations industry and uh, the academic uh, side of it and you know the journalistic side and all these kinds of things I've been sampling, uh, I suspect if one did a comparative study, you'd find that they develop primarily in relatively free societies. Uh, ours is a very free society in the sense that the state has, by comparative standards, very limited resources to control by force. And I think it's undoubtedly, in fact, the most sophisticated in the terms of, in the reliance on techniques of indoctrination and control, public relations industry in particular as a, an American creation. Uh, you'll notice, of course, the close similarity to Leninist ideology, to Bolshevism, which also assumes that the radical intellectuals uh, are the specialized class, the vanguard, and they've got to lead the stupid and ignorant masses to a better society. In fact, the two conceptions are very much alike. Uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons why there's been historically such an easy transition from one to another. The move from being a Leninist enthusiast to a, uh, you know, a passionate supporter of uh, uh, state capitalism and you know, working for American aims, that takes place overnight. It's been going on for years. Uh, it's called the God that failed transition. Uh, and it happens very simply. I mean, in the early stages, it had some authenticity to it when people like Ignazio Salone and others were making this transition. But in recent years, it's become just a farce, I mean, technique of opportunism. Uh, and the transition is very easy, I think, because there isn't much of a difference in ideological change. Uh, it's just a matter of where you think power lies. If you think there's going to be a popular revolution, and you can ride that revolution to state power and then wield the whip over the masses, you're a Leninist enthusiast. If you see that that's not going to happen and power lies in the state capitalist institutions which you have to serve as a manager, an ideological manager, you do that. But it's basically a very similar position. And in fact, uh, in the last century or so, since there's been a more or less identifiable secular intelligentsia, uh, I think you find typically that they fall into one or the other of these two categories. They uh, associate themselves with one or the other system of power and hierarchy uh, and uh, subordination. Uh, in fact, what I just said is almost a tautology. It's only if you submit to those systems that you're counted as a respectable intellectual for obvious reasons. Well, coming up to more modern times in the post-Second World War period, uh, you find, again, a deep concern over the need to control and deceive the public, to control the public mind. Uh, presidential historian Thomas Bailey wrote in 1948, at the time when we were sort of setting off on a new war, the Cold War, he wrote, because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it's at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we're willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And uh, in 1981, as the United States was launching a new crusade for freedom, uh, Samuel Huntington, the professor of government at Harvard, uh, said in a private but published discussion, uh, interchange, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine, which is quite accurate and gives a certain insight into the nature of the Cold War, in particular into the nature of the war against Nicaragua, which is what he specifically had in mind. Well, these concerns over uh, controlling the public mind tend to rise to the surface, particularly uh, after periods of wars and turmoil, like the 17th century revolution, the Civil War, or like the First World War, when Woodrow Wilson launched the major Red Scare, which is the major example in modern American history, of all of American history of state repression. That was really large-scale and effective. 
in destroying unions and uh, uh, destroying independent politics and uh, eliminating independent thought and so on. And the same thing happened after World War II uh, with the uh, phenomenon that's uh, mislabeled McCarthyism. It's mislabeled because it was actually initiated by the liberal Democrats in the late 1940s. McCarthy just came along at the tail end of it and vulgarized it a little. Uh, the reason for this is, an, uh, is that uh, periods of wars and turmoil have a tendency to uh, arouse people from apathy and to make them think and to make them organize often. So that's why you get things like the Red Scare and McCarthyism uh, right after periods of war and turmoil. And the same thing happened after the Vietnam War, which had the same effect. Uh, after the Vietnam War, uh, elites were concerned about what they called a crisis of democracy. In fact, one of the most interesting books on this topic, or one of the most interesting books on most of the insightful books, I think, on, modern, uh, on the modern democratic system is called The Crisis of Democracy. It's a study, the only book-length study, published by the Trilateral Commission. Uh, it's an important group put together by David Rockefeller in 1973, and it represents the more or less liberal internationalists from the three major centers of modern capitalism, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan hence trilateral. And remember, this is the liberals. This is the group out of which uh, Jimmy Carter and most of his administration came. Uh, the cri what's the crisis of democracy that they're concerned with in all of the democratic societies? Well, the crisis is that uh, during the 1960s, uh, large groups of people who are normally passive and apathetic began to try to enter the political arena to press their demands. Uh, and that's a crisis. Uh, which has to be overcome. The, the naive might call that democracy, but that's because they don't understand. The sophisticated understand that that's a crisis of democracy. Uh, the American spokesman, again, Samuel Huntington, uh, wrote in his report that uh, Harry Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. In those days, there was no crisis of democracy. Things were working just right. But in the 1960s, you got all this turmoil. I mean, young people and women and you know, uh, uh, labor. I mean, all kinds of weird people who were supposed to be sitting quietly in the corners uh, began to get involved and caused this crisis. I mean, the same crisis that arose in the 17th century and that repeatedly arises uh, when people begin to try to take advantage of the uh, uh, formal opportunities that exist. Uh, among the terrible things that were happening during the 60s causing this crisis, they said, was that you had this group of people who they called value-oriented intellectuals, uh, people who were concerned with things like truth and justice and all that sort of nonsense, uh, and they're opposed to the good guys, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals, they called them the commissars, the ones who just do the job, you know. Uh, but you had these value-oriented intellectuals, and they were doing all sorts of horrible things like uh, Undermine, delegitimizing the institutions that are responsible for the indoctrination of the young, like schools and universities. Remember, this is an internal discussion, so they kind of let their hair down. Uh, their general proposal at the end of all of this, these lengthy and thoughtful discussions was that what we need is more moderation in democracy to mitigate the excess of democracy and to overcome the crisis. Uh, in plain terms, what that means is that the public has to be reduced to their proper state of apathy and obedience and driven from the public arena if democracy is to survive in the appropriate sense with the specialized class, you know, the cool observers, uh, smart guys, uh, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals doing our job in the interests of the people who have real power. Uh, that's the liberal side. I won't go into what the reactionary side says about the matter. Well, uh, to summarize, uh, there is a standard view of democracy. Uh, it's the view of Justice Powell. The public should assert, or the view that he expressed at least, the, the view that the public ought to assert meaningful control over the political process. And there's a contrary view. The contrary view is that the public's a dangerous enemy, and it has to be controlled for its own good, of course, the way you control children, like you don't let a three-year-old run across the street. Now, the first view uh, is the rhetorical view. Now, the second view is the view that's actually held, uh, and you can see that it's actually held when a crisis of democracy erupts and the unwashed masses uh, 
uh, begin to try to enter into the political arena and have to be somehow repressed, either by force, as in the Red Scare, or by other means uh, uh, in order to overcome the crisis of democracy. Well, with regard uh, to the, the media play a big role in this, and with regard to the media too, there is a standard view. Uh, the standard view, for example, is expressed again by Justice Powell in the same discussion when he claims that it's the crucial role of the media to affect the societal purpose of the First Amendment, that is to it, allow the public to assert control of the political process. Standard view was also expressed by Judge Gerfein in an important decision, uh, the Pentagon Papers decision, when he permitted the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers. And he said, we have a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press, and it must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. Uh, that's one view, that's the standard view. And given that view, we then have a debate. The debate is, uh, is over, whether the, over whether the media have gone too far in their defiance of authority and their adversarial stance. Now, uh, the right wing claims they've gone too far. They're overcome by a liberal bias. We've got to do something about it. Uh, the liberals, as in the Trilateral Commission, uh, all, in fact, agree. Uh, they, in the same study, they say that the media threaten government authority by their adversarial stance, and they've got to be curbed. If they can't curb themselves, the government is going to have to move in to curb them. Curb them. Uh, the executive director of Freedom House, Leonard Sussman, uh, asked whether free institutions must be, uh, must free institutions be overthrown by the very freedom they sustain? Rhetorical question, meaning we got to do something about uh, this excess uh, uh, freedom that the press is using to attack the government. He was writing about the uh, a Freedom House study of the coverage of the Tet Offensive, which became a sort of a classic, uh, allegedly showing that uh, uh, the press lost the war in Vietnam by uh, unfair criticism of the government during the Tet Offensive. It's an interesting, if there's no time to talk about it, I may try to get back to it. If not, maybe get to it in discussion. Very interesting study. It was total fraud. Uh, falsified the data, you know, the whole thing was faked. When you actually correct the errors, uh, it turns out that the press, that the real charge of Freedom House was that the press, although completely supportive of the government policy and working completely within the framework of government propaganda, nevertheless was too pessimistic, they said. Uh, they didn't tell you by what standards it was too pessimistic. The obvious standard is to compare it with, say, internal U.S. intelligence assessments, which we have thanks to the Pentagon Papers, and it turns out the press was more optimistic than U.S. intelligence because they were believing the public statements and they didn't know about the private statements. Uh, so Freedom House's complaint reduces to the fact that the press uh, though, prop, though su totally supportive of the propaganda, didn't do it in an upbeat enough fashion. I wouldn't have surprised George Orwell that that should be the criticism of the press produced by an organization called Freedom House. Uh, but that's become, the, uh, uh, that's become the standard since everyone refers to that as the study that proves that the press was too adversarial. Well, uh, that's the debate. Uh, then, then the defenders of the press say, no, we're not too adversarial, maybe we are too adversarial, but uh, you've got to tolerate us even though we're cantankerous and so on. That's essentially the issue. Well, outside of that debate between those who say the press is too adversarial and must be curbed and those who say, well, yes, the press is cantankerous and impossible, but we just have to suffer that in the interest of freedom, uh, outside the spectrum of that debate, which constitutes virtually the entire mainstream discussion, virtually the entire discussion. But outside the debate, there is another position. Uh, the other position challenges the factual assumption that's taken for granted in the debate. According to this alternative view, the media do indeed fulfill a societal purpose, but a very different one. Their societal purpose is to inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of the privileged groups that dominate the domestic society. And they do this in all sorts of ways. They do it by selection of topics, by distribution of concern, by the way they frame issues, by filtering of information, uh, by emphasis and tone, by simple fabrication sometimes, but crucially by the bounding of debate to make sure that it doesn't go outside of certain limits.
uh, the bounding both in the news columns and in the opinion columns, because of course the news columns themselves embody all sorts of assumptions and ideological presuppositions and so on. Uh, to the, according to this alternative view, to the extent that there is a liberal bias, uh, it serves primarily to bound thinkable thought. Uh, that is to instill the unchallengeable assumptions uh, which in fact reflect this rather narrow elite consensus. So the liberal bias performs a real function. It says thus far and no further. I'm as far as you can go and I go as far, how, uh, how far I go is still accepting the basic presuppositions as unchallengeable. Now within those bounds there's ample controversy uh, and it reflects the tactical divisions uh, among elites over how to achieve generally shared aims. Uh, but these limits are very rarely transcended. So the media thus function in accordance with what uh, my co-author Edward Herman and I have called a propaganda model in a recent book. Uh, that's another view. Well, uh, the, prop the propaganda model has a lot of predictions, has a lot of predictions about how the press is going to behave, but it also has a further prediction. Uh, the further prediction is that no matter how well confirmed the propaganda model is, it cannot be taken seriously and therefore must be effectively excluded from mainstream discussion. And that actually follows from the model itself. The reason is that the model, if you think it through, the model uh, rejects certain principles that are serviceable to power. That is, it falls outside the spectrum uh, defined by the presupposition that the media are adversarial and cantankerous, perhaps excessively so. Now that presupposition is a useful one. It's serviceable to the interests of established institutions to believe that what you're reading is actually criticism if it's in fact support. That's a technique, it's a sophisticated technique of indoctrination. Uh, and of course it's very serviceable to the media themselves. It's nice to think that you're, uh, you know, pride yourself on being an independent and courageous uh, uh, adversary of power. And since those assumptions are serviceable, they're going to be upheld according to the propaganda model and no serious challenge will be permitted. So uh, that prediction indeed is very readily confirmed. The propaganda model is never taken seriously. It can't be considered. Uh, notice that the propaganda model has a rather disconcerting feature to it. Uh, plainly as a matter of logic, it's either valid or invalid. Uh, if it's invalid, you can dismiss it. If it's valid, you must dismiss it because it's saying the wrong thing. So one way or another, it's got to be dismissed. Uh, by its very nature. Uh, and uh, notice that truth is no defense. Uh, it's very much like the traditional doctrine of seditious libel, uh, the doctrine that it's, you can't, it's libelous, it's a crime to criticize state authorities because uh, that undermines power. It's a doctrine that runs up to pretty modern times. Uh, and truth was never a defense against seditious libel. In fact, truth simply heightened the enormous enormity of the crime of uh, calling authority into disrepute. And the same is true here. Well, of course, the basic, pr the basic uh, questions are factual. Uh, are the standard assumptions correct? That is, is it true that the press is independent, cantankerous, adversarial, maybe excessively so? Or are the assumptions of the propaganda model correct? That's a factual question. Uh, and that's the main topic, but I'm barely going to be able to get into it. Uh, but before, though I won't try to really, you know, no, no hope in a few minutes of providing real evidence one way or another, uh, let me just talk a little bit about the, the way you would deal with this problem, some methodological questions. Uh, first, notice three comments. One, the propaganda model has a certain prior plausibility to it. That is, if you'd simply accept uncontroversial free market assumptions, quite uncontroversial assumptions about how society works, you're led almost automatically to the propaganda model. Uh, you can see that pretty simply. Simply ask yourself what the media are. Now, notice here I'm talking about what some might call the agenda-setting media, the media that set the frame that others adapt to. And that's a pretty narrow group. It's primarily the New York Times and the Washington Post and the three television channels and a couple of others. It's not much else. Those set the framework that everyone else pretty well adapts to uh, within anything like the mainstream. So we're talking about the agenda setting media and ask yourself what they are. Well, what they are is very large corporations. Uh, in fact, they're integrated with, uh, often owned by even larger conglomerates. 
Now, like other businesses, they have a product that they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, other businesses, and the product is audiences. Uh, the media don't finance themselves on their audiences. In fact, the audiences are usually a loss. The more you subscribe, the more the newspaper loses money. And of course, the television set, you know, they make anything when you turn it on. Uh, they make their money from advertisers. Advertising rates go up if you have a, the right kind of audience. Incidentally, a relatively privileged audience raises advertising rates. Uh, so what the media are, just as an institution, is major corporations selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what would you expect to come out of such a system? You'd expect to come out something that reflects the interests of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. That uh, wouldn't be very surprising. In fact, it would be amazing if it weren't true. Uh, quite apart from that, there are many other things pressing in the same direction. There are, after all, centers of power in the society, I mean, the state, you know, the corporate sector and others, and they can impose punishments for if things go wrong and re offer rewards if things go right. You gain by adapting to them. It's less costly uh, uh, and so on. Furthermore, the top managerial positions in the uh, media, uh, editors and columnists and so on, uh, if you make it into those positions, you're part of the privileged elite, part of the very top, in fact. Uh, uh, the, that's where your associations are and your perceptions and your friends and the people you play golf with and everything else. And it wouldn't be very surprising, again, if you reflected the same interests. Uh, and it goes on. If you think through, uh, we discuss this in our book a lot, but if you think through it, there are just many pressures uh, which lead immediately to the assumption that the propaganda model is highly plausible, even without any evidence. It's at least, it's got prior plausibility. In fact, it would be rather surprising if it weren't true on uncontroversial assumptions. That's point one. Point two is it has a lot of elite advocacy. That's what I started with, pointing out that it represents a position that intellectual elites have thought the media ought to serve, and the whole system of education and so on ought to serve. Uh, that's the position since the 17th century, probably the dominant position. It's necessary to manufacture consent for the general good because of the stupidity of the average man and so on. We have to put aside these democratic dogmatisms. So we have a position that has prior plausibility and elite advocacy. And a third point is it's generally accepted by the public. It's very striking that the debate over the media is determined by the intellectuals. And they're the most indoctrinated sector of the society. And for them, the only debate is over whether uh, the media are too adversarial or not. But there are polls. You ask the public, what do you think about the media? And the poll public generally thinks the media are too conformist and too subordinate to power. In other words, they automatically accept something like the propaganda model. So here we have three facts, a position that has prior plausibility, uh, elite advocacy, and rather general public support. Well, that doesn't prove that it's valid, of course, but it does suggest that it ought to be part of the discussion. Uh, it's not part of the discussion, exactly as the model predicts. Now, by now, turning to the factual matter, there are by now thousands of pages of documentation, detailed, close documentation, uh, on the propaganda model. And uh, it's been tested in just about every conceivable way, subjected to the harshest tests we can think of. I think by now it's one of the best confirmed uh, uh, theses of the social sciences. Uh, th if there's any serious challenge to it, I've never seen it. It's generally just ignored or else caricatured. Uh, so what you have is this very well-confirmed thesis, not proven, uh, very well-confirmed thesis, no serious challenge to it, to my knowledge. Uh, it has prior plausibility. The model's plausible on uncontroversial assumptions, advocated by elites, generally supported by the public, but it's not part of the discussion, exactly in accord with its predictions. It's off the agenda. Well, the next task, and the interesting one, would be to look at uh, actual details. As I say, there's plenty of things you can look at in print. Indeed, thousands of pages and more coming out. Uh, and I'm not going to, I almost hesitate to give examples because they're misleading. Uh, any set of examples will be misleading because I think its predictions are essentially universally confirmed with only statistical error. So giving examples is misleading because you might argue plausibly that the examples are not properly selected. That would be a reasonable response, and that's why you have to look at a range of tests to make sure they are properly selected, like let the people who think that the media are adversarial pick their own grounds. That's the harshest test that the model can 
face. So let them pick the grounds. Well, they've picked their grounds, things like the coverage of the Tet Offensive and so on. And it turns out that everything you go to, Tet Offensive, Watergate, Iran-Contra hearings, you take a look at them, it, they show precisely the subservience of the press to established power. Uh, uh, compare paired historical examples. I mean, history doesn't run controlled experiments, but it runs things that are reasonably close. Uh, for example, you can find similar times and similar periods when uh, uh, you can find atrocities of roughly the same scale carried out by official enemies or by ourselves and our clients and look at the comparative coverage or good deeds like elections carried out by our clients and our enemies and look at the comparative coverage. Uh, all of these tests and in fact every other one I've ever been able, we've ever been able to concoct leads to the same conclusion. The propaganda model is quite valid as a very good first approximation to the way the media function. Uh, just to give a few examples, and I stress again they're misleading because they're few, uh, take say the question of freedom of press. That's a picket it because it's obviously a matter that the press is naturally much concerned about. And in fact, uh, it, the press has been very much concerned about freedom of the press in the last decade, let's just keep to the last decade, uh, in the last decade, there's been plenty of material in the press about freedom of the press, uh, mainly in Latin America. And uh, ask your friends to name one newspaper in Latin America that uh, has raised freedom of press issues. Uh, which newspaper in Latin America has been suppressed unfairly by uh, a state and therefore we have to defend it? Well, you know, 99 people out of 100 will name La Prensa in Nicaragua. Uh, and the reason they'll name it is because there's been massive coverage of the tribulations of La Prensa in Nicaragua. Uh, there was a study by, in Harper's Magazine by Francisco Goldman, a media analyst, who found uh, that the New York Times alone was giving like, something like five references a month, that's more than one a week, to the tribulations of La Prensa in Nicaragua. That's probably more coverage than all freedom of the press issues throughout the rest of the world combined. Probably much more, in fact. Well, that's an interesting choice. Uh, uh, we can take a look at it. Uh, not, not only coverage, but also um, enthusiastic uh, support. I mean, the, for example, in, in 1986, in June 1986, there was an interesting series of events. Uh, the World Court condemned the United States for its unlawful use of force and violation of treaties uh, in its war against Nicaragua and called upon the United States to desist from these crimes. Congress responded to this by uh, voting $100 million in aid to increase, to accelerate the unlawful use of force. Uh, the Reagan administration announced that this is for real, this is a real war. Uh, and there was enthusiastic coverage of that. The World Court decision was simply dismissed as an annoying bit of nonsense, uh, either ignored or falsified, but anyway, dismissed. It's the court that was the criminal, not the United States. Uh, the, uh, in response to this uh, virtual declaration of war, as the Reagan administration described it, the Nicaraguan government suspended La Prensa. And that led to virtual hysteria in the United States. The uh, Neiman Fellows, the journalism fellows at Harvard, uh, off immediately gave the owner of La Prensa, Violeta Chamorro, a, an award. Uh, the Washington Post had a big editorial saying she deserves ten awards. You know, uh, it's a newspaper of valor. That was the head of the, that was the heading. The Murray Kempton, the left liberal columnist in the New York Review, uh, issued a plea to people to provide funds for La Prensa to keep its equipment going, that those funds could be added to the rather substantial CIA uh, subvention to La Prensa ever since 1979, uh, and on and on. Uh, well, uh, what is La Prensa? Uh, La Prensa is an interesting newspaper. It's probably unique in history. Uh, it's often believed that La Prensa is the newspaper that courageously opposed the, the Somoza dictatorship. And if you read the press, that's what you would believe. Well, it does have the same name as that newspaper, but that's about where it ends. Uh, in uh, 1980, the, uh, right after the Sandinista Revolution, the owners of La Prensa uh, fired the editor and 80% uh, of the staff left with him uh, because the staff and the editor refused to support their uh, pro-contra policy. Uh, 
Now, the editor and the staff formed another newspaper on the way of the Diario, uh, and if a newspaper is constituted of its editor and its staff, that's the old La Prensa. If a newspaper is constituted of the money that's behind it, well, of course, the new La Prensa is the old La Prensa. So you just decide how to decide now what a newspaper is. Is it the staff and the editor, or is it the owners and the equipment? Uh, this you'll never read about, but it's a fact. Now, the new La Prensa uh, supports the overthrow of the government by a foreign power and does it quite openly, and it's funded by the foreign power that is trying to overthrow the government. Now, that's pretty unusual. In fact, I can't think of any remote parallel in the history of the Western democracies. So, for example, during the Second World War, uh, England did not permit Nazi Germany to, put, to fund and run a major newspaper in London. And the United States did not permit Japan, say, uh, to dominate, uh, you know, to, to invest in and run a major newspaper coming out of New York. In fact, uh, we don't have to go that far. Uh, England and the United States imposed harsh censorship. Uh, they wouldn't even let tiny little uh, uh, dissident newspapers go through the mails or appear and, and so on. Uh, there's, no there's no remote parallel in Western history to this, as far as I can see. Uh, this, incidentally, is never mentioned in media commentary. Well, nevertheless, a true civil libertarian will defend La Prensa from harassment, even though this is unique in human history, this fact, because if you're a real civil libertarian, uh, you think that uh, the United States should have allowed Japan and Germany to dominate the American media during the Second World War, if you're a real civil libertarian. Uh, but. Uh, uh, we, we now ask, we, are not, we now make the obvious question, I mean, we ask whether the, um, you know, the great excitement, the uh, virtual hysteria of American intellectuals over La Prensa is, reflects their libertarian passions, uh, or whether it's because they believe, uh, or whether it's because they're serving power, as a propaganda model predicts. That's a fair question, and there's a test. There's an obvious test, and we all know how to apply it. It's a test that we apply all the time when we look at our enemies. So, for example, suppose you take a look at the productions of the um, East German uh, Peace Group or the World Peace Council, which is sort of a communist front organization. You read their publicity, their, and you'll see that they have a lot of criticisms of the United States, often very valid criticisms. Uh, in fact, their critical discussion of repression in the United States and in U.S. Uh, dependencies not only is often valid, but it's often the kind of thing that's not reported here. Well, do we honor them for that? No, of course not. We regard them with contempt. And the reason is by, because we apply a very simple and obvious test. We ask, what do they say about the repression and atrocities for which they're responsible? What do they say about Soviet repression and atrocities? And as soon as we find out the answer to that question, we just simply dismiss them with contempt, rightly. Uh, uh, you begin by talking about your own responsibility, and then sort of, you know, on a footnote somewhere, you can talk about the bad things done by other guys at least if you regard yourself as a moral agent, you know, as somebody worthy of minimal respect and attention. Uh, we understand that in the case of our enemies, and we might have enough honesty to apply the same test to ourselves, so let's try it. Uh, we can now apply the test. We have this tremendous libertarian passion over La Prensa, the first newspaper in history, uh, to be funded by a foreign power calling for the overthrow of the government uh, uh, in which it appears, in which it's published, and remember, this is not a major power. It's not like the United States, which was never under threat during the Second World War. This is a poor third world country, which is barely able to survive the attack of a superpower. So we, we have that, and we can ask how the same press has reacted uh, to other examples of repression during the same period, in fact, in the same area. Well, there are test cases, so let's try a few. Uh, let's take El Salvador, right nearby, except the U.S. client. Uh, there once was an independent press in El Salvador, two small newspapers, uh, La Cronica and El Independiente, two small newspapers. They were not supported by a foreign power trying to overthrow the government. They were not particularly left-wing. Uh, they were independent, run by businessmen. They sort of challenged the distribution of power. You know, they said maybe we should have some land reform or something like that. Well, they're not around anymore. Uh, they're not around because the government that we arm, fund, train, and support uh, sent its security forces to destroy them. Uh, one newspaper was eliminated by the simple device of uh, taking an editor and a photojournalist who were in a San Salvador restaurant, taking them out, the security forces went in, took them outside, cut them to pieces with machetes, and left them in a ditch. At that point, the owner fled, and that took care of one newspaper. Uh, 
Uh, the second newspaper took a little harder. It took uh, several bombings, uh, th three assassination attempts on the editor. Uh, finally, the army uh, surrounded the premises with tanks and uh, then broke in and smashed the place up and destroyed it. They had previously a machine gunning attack. It killed a newsboy. At that point, the editor fled. That took care of the second newspaper. Uh, well, that was uh, eight years ago. Uh, so we can now ask, uh, how much attention did that receive? That's an example of a violation of freedom of the press, a little more severe than the uh, harassment of La Prensa. Uh, well, there's an answer to that. You can check the New York Times, for example. It has never received one word of mention in the New York Times news columns. It has never received one editorial mention uh, in all of these years. And the same is true of the other media. It simply doesn't matter. These are atrocities committed by our clients, uh, the guys we pay and train to do that sort of thing. Uh, so all of a sudden, our concern for freedom of the press disappears. Uh, or let's take another U.S. client, in fact, the major U.S. client, Israel, which receives by far the major U.S. aid, and is again not a small country under attack by a superpower. Uh, well, uh, here, here too, history has set up some interesting tests. Uh, the same, at exactly the same time that Nicaragua suspended La Prensa after uh, the virtual declaration of war uh, in violation of the world court proceedings. At the very same time, Israel closed down, closed down permanently two Jerusalem newspapers, Arab newspapers, of course, closed down two Jerusalem newspapers uh, on the charge that uh, the security forces had claimed that they were supported by a terrorist group, by a hostile group. Well, that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court judged that that was legitimate because, in it, as it explained in its judgment, uh, no state will ever permit uh, no, a business, no matter how legitimate it is, that's supported by hostile elements. Uh, and although we have freedom of speech in Israel, it does not extend to uh, activities that might threaten the security of the state. Uh, well, how much cover that's much more severe than what happened in the La Prensa case, so how much coverage did that get? Well, actually, that did get one mention in the U.S. press, uh, it was mentioned in a letter of mine in the Boston Globe commenting on the hypocrisy of the Neiman Fellows. Uh, notice that the, they did not give a prize to these editors. In fact, that was never even reported. Uh, after the Central America Peace Accords, um, La Prensa was opened. Uh, the week right at the time it was opened, uh, Israel closed a Nazareth newspaper, that's inside Israel, closed a Nazareth newspaper permanently on grounds that it uh, had, uh, it was supported again by hostile elements. The editor again went to the Supreme Court, uh, pleaded that everything that appeared in the newspaper passed through censorship. That was disregarded on the grounds that uh, if the state says it's supported by hostile elements, that's all that's required. You never need any evidence when the state comes along and says security reasons. The courts just accept it. Uh, they also closed a, a news office in Nablus on the grounds that uh, the editor who had already been in, who was already in jail, in fact, he was in jail for having alleged, not without charge, without legal charge on the claim that he had contact with hostile elements. Uh, his wife had been running the newspapers, claimed that she'd maintained those contacts. So they closed the press office. Well, how much coverage did that get in the, in the U.S. press? Answer, as far as I can find, zero uh, in both cases. Well, I could, here's, two, here's some real controlled experiments that history was kind enough to set up for us. I picked the week of the suspension of La Prensa and the week of the opening of La Prensa. I picked a case in El Salvador. Just to round it off, let's take our other client state, Guatemala, and let's come up to more recent times. Uh, Guatemala, uh, we, the United States enthusiastically supported a vast outbreak of terror and violence in Guatemala in the early 80s. Uh, the Reaganites were positively uh, passionate in their enthusiasm for this. Uh, maybe 100,000 people were slaughtered, something like that. Uh, maybe something roughly of that neighborhood. However, after uh, sufficient massacre had been carried out, uh, they had uh, what's called a democratic election, uh, and uh, uh, there's supposed to be a democracy in Guatemala. That's what they tell us. Well, one of the pe during this uh, uh, period of U.S.-backed slaughter, uh, they didn't have any censorship. Uh, it, the problems of the press were taken care of simply by murdering journalists. About 50 journalists were murdered, uh, including, you know, television journalists right in the middle of broadcasts and so on. And for some reason, you didn't need any censorship when that was going on. In fact, that was never barely discussed. You'll find bare mention of it in the press. Well, after the return of democracy, which we 
pride ourselves on. Uh, one of the editors who had fled and was living in Mexico decided to return, and he opened a small newspaper about a year ago, last February, called La Epoca. Again, it wasn't calling for the overthrow of the government, it wasn't supported by a foreign power. It was just a kind of a left liberal journal, small left liberal journal. When he came back to uh, Guatemala, uh, there were immediately death threats from the uh, uh, death squads, which are just adjuncts of the security forces, uh, warning him that he was either going to be killed or flee. He wasn't going to allow to run that newspaper. He nevertheless went ahead, and the newspaper published a couple of issues. Uh, and uh, then uh, in July, uh, 15 armed men broke into the offices, firebombed them, kidnapped the night watchman, uh, and destroyed the premises. Uh, the next day, the editor, Brian Barrera, held a press conference to which no one came, except some people from the European press, uh, and said that plainly there's no possibility for free expression in Guatemala. Uh, he then received another death threat, warning him he better get out of the country, he'd be killed. Uh, he was taken to the airport by a European ambassador to make sure that he could get out alive, uh, and he fled back to Mexico. Well, how much coverage did that get? Answer, zero. Nothing in the New York Times, nothing in the Washington Post. That's just last year. Now, it's not that they didn't know about it. We know perfectly well that they knew about it. Uh, first of all, because it was on the international, it was on the wires and so on and so forth, but also because they themselves referred to it obliquely later. Uh, about a month later, there was an article in the New York Times on some cultural conference in Guatemala back in the arts pages, uh, and the uh, uh, correspondent who went there had some remark buried in there about uh, 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 La Epoca. The tr point is it just doesn't matter. I mean, that's, uh, it's not just harassment and suppression. It's it's, you know, destruction and physical destruction and murder, but it's carried out by our clients, so it doesn't matter. Well, those are the kinds of things you find when you look. That's the end of this Alternative Views, but Noam Chomsky will be back next time, and he'll conclude his speech and take questions from the audience. We'd like to thank Paul Lukowski and Jim Dickerson, who provided us with a tape of the speech of Noam Chomsky as it was recorded in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And also, Laura